Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you can see the screen clearly. Today, I will uh, talk about my experience on crack control in massive concrete casting related to the construction of the Mosel Venice dams that uh, has been uh, followed by my university between uh, 2006 and 2009. Well, let's start from the beginning. I will spend a few words on the high tide phenomenon in Venice. Venice is an important city in the northeast of Italy. It is built on a lagoon and it is very ancient and it is subjected to a phenomenon of high tide. So the city is uh, sometimes flooded by the sea because of a series of different uh, phenomena that superpose themselves. Of course, high tides are due to the astronomic tide, which is related to the sun position, the moon position, and it is very regular and can be calculated with precision. But uh, in the lagoon, it is also uh, due to some meteorological contributions, which are irregular, and difficult to be forecasted in advance. Um, for instance, the uh, most uh, important uh, weather conditions that can determine high tide are wind, especially when the wind is blowing from the sea to the land, uh, and so uh, pulling water inside the lagoon. Rain, of course, the rivers inlet, because in the lagoon are uh, present some uh, rivers, and the atmospheric pressure. In uh, uh, this diagram, uh, you see the uh, variation of the average sea level in Venice between 1970 and 2013. So on the horizontal axis, you can see the uh, time in years, and in uh, the vertical axis, the um, height of the sea measured in uh, centimeters. So you may see that uh, the average level of the sea is uh, slowly uh, increasing in time. Of course, the green curve is irregular, it is going up and down, but uh, we can uh, draw some uh, straight lines and uh, we can see that uh, in this period of time, the average uh, increase in the sea level is about 25 uh, centimeters per uh, century, which is quite a, a big number. But uh, let's have a look to um, the reasons that are related to this increase. The uh, main causes of the uh, average sea level increase are um, Two, uh, the first one is eustasy, that is the real increase of the level of the sea, uh, not related to the land uh, movement. So it is an overall increase of the uh, seas um, due to uh, rise of temperature in the planet, uh, due to the melting of the ice in uh, the North and South Pole and other phenomena. So eustasy is a global phenomenon. And then uh, there is subsidence, uh, which is the uh, decrease of the level of the soil and uh, it is a local phenomenon and uh, it uh, was present mainly in the Venice area between 1930 and 1970 because of uh, water pumping from the soil uh, for industrial use because in that period just behind the city of Venice, there was a big industrial site, chemistry, uh, chemical industries, which were using a lot of water and pumping it out from the soil. So if you look at the diagram uh, at the bottom of this slide, you see again a variation of the uh, sea level uh, in time. So on the horizontal axis are years from 1872 to 2016, so more than a century on the horizontal uh, axis. And on the vertical axis, there is the 
overall medium level of the sea measured in centimeters and referred to the zero, which is the level that was measured in 1872. So the two curves, the red one and the blue one, are related to two different cities that are both in North Italy. They are not so far away from each other. The red one is Venice and the blue one is Trieste. Uh, Trieste is not inside the Lagoon and it is not suffering from a subsidence. So we can see with the blue curve that the level of the sea is overall uh, coming up, but with the red curve, we have the superposition of two effects. One effect, which is the same of, of the blue one, which is global, all the planet, and one effect which is local in the red one. And so we see a quicker increase in the period between 1930 and 1970. So the difference between the uh, blue curve and the red curve is mostly due to that period. And this is related only to the uh, site of Venice. So, how is uh, high time measured? The uh, referring zero for the sea level in, in Venice is the mean sea level measured in 1897. And uh, according to an observation period between 1962 and uh, 2000, we can uh, see that we have high tides higher than 80 centimeters from the zero level, only 126 hours in a year. Then we can have 90 centimeters respect to the zero level for only 51 hours a year, 100 centimeters respect to zero for only 20 hours a year, and more than 110 centimeters with respect to zero only for eight hours a year. Why do we use as a conventional zero level the level at 1897? Because in that period there was no industries, there was very little anthropic effect on the city, and so we can refer to the level of the sea at the end of the 19th century as the level, the historical level. Only in the 20th century, we went through deep transformation inside the Lagoon. So we can see that the level of the sea at the end of the 19th century is more or less the same level that we had in the Middle Age when the city was growing and was built. So what can we see from these numbers? We can see that uh, we expect one meter of tide a maximum, one meter, uh, a, bit, a little bit more than one meter, but only for a very short period every year. So let's have a look to what can be caused by this uh, high tide. So on the table on your left, you see the uh, increase of the sea level measured in centimeters from plus 90 centimeters to more than 180 centimeters on the zero level that we have seen before. And on the right column, you can see a percentage of the flooded area in Venice related to all these levels. So we can see that with 90 centimeters, almost no part of the city is flooded. With one meter, we go to 3.56% of the city. And between one meter and one meter and 10 centimeters, we can see that San Marco Square and all the uh, area, which is the real heart of the city, goes underwater. So the big difference is there when we uh, pass one meter of, of tide. On the table on your right, you see the uh, worst uh, flooding that uh, we went through in the city of Venice uh, during uh, the last years. And we see that the worst flooding was uh, on the 4th of November 1966 with more than one meter and 90 centimeters of tide. Then we had another big flood on the 22nd of December 1979 and all the others that you can read in this table. What can we see? We can see that uh, uh, most of these 
uh, high tide are concentrated in uh, present times. So you see a lot of uh, years that are 2000, 2009, 2010, 2012. So many, a lot of these phenomena are uh, concentrated in the short past. So it is a phenomenon that is getting worse during time. And you may see that the amount of times that we had the city completely flooded because with more than 140 40 centimeters, we have 90% of the city, which is under the level of the sea, uh, are uh, quite a lot. So we can also have a look to the same phenomena from another point of view. In this table, you can see the number of occurrences that happened for each tide level uh, measured in uh, uh, Punta della Salute, which is the uh, official uh, measuring point for the city of Venice, and the duration in hours and minutes that uh, the phenomenon lasted. So we can see that the worst uh, tide, the one with uh, one meter and 90 centimeter, only lasted 10 minutes. Then we can have a, a tide between 1.5 meters and 1.8 meters, which was lasting one hour and 30 minutes. And the number of occurrences per year is one every 50 years, one every 49, one every 50 years. And so on and so forth. If we go down in the table, we can see that if we decrease the level of the tide, the number of, of occurrences in history is increasing up to, let's say, 2,600 for a tide, which is uh, bigger between 57 and 80 centimeters, the bottom line. And this can happen 64 times per year. So the tides that we are interested in are the one uh, between one meter, over one meter, let's say. And in this case, we can see that uh, in the history of the last century, they have been 77. And the average uh, time was two hours and 30 minutes. So to solve this problem of uh, high tide in the city of Venice, uh, the MOSE project, which is a uh, movable dam system, uh, was uh, designed at uh, the beginning of the uh, 2000. So let's have a look to the uh, geographical location. You can see in the picture on the left a uh, um, satellite uh, image showing you the city of uh, Venice in the lagoon and showing you uh, in the three yellow uh, circles, the three inlets that are the doors that communicate between the sea on the right and the lagoon on the left. So we have three uh, openings which are called the Lido one on the north, the Malamocco one in the middle and the Chioggia one at the bottom. If you look at the pictures on the right, they are zoomed in the three uh, circles, and they are showing you the uh, actual configuration of these three inlets at the end of the construction of the uh, dam system with all the uh, works that have been done in these uh, three uh, inlets. Let's have a look to the uh, general concept. The, the movable dam system is a, um, a barrier which for most of the time cannot be seen. So if you go to Venice, the, you're, uh, you are likely not to see anything about this dam because if uh, the situation is under control, if we don't have uh, flooding uh, troubles, the dam is completely submerged. So nobody sees it. You can see uh, in the picture at the bottom of this slide, that uh, there is the, the sea, of course, in blue, and the, the ground beneath the sea in brown. And we have a foundation of this movable dam system, which is inside the ground, completely submerged, and a movable part of the dam, which is this flap, which is colored in yellow in the uh, top 
picture. And uh, this flap is a steel casing, and this uh, casing can be full of water. And you can see the picture on the top right of this uh, slide with the casing, which is in the rest position, completely submerged and full of water. And then when the uh, casing has to be lifted, air is pumped inside this steel structure and uh, filling the uh, casing with air. The water, of course, goes away and behaving like a submarine, this uh, stru steel structure is coming up. And when this steel structure is coming up, you see it emerging from the sea and you find it in the uh, top position, which is shown to you in the picture at the bottom right of this slide, where only a little part of water is inside the steel structure. And this steel structure is um, generating a barrier between the level of the sea outside, which is higher, and the level of the lagoon inside, which is uh, lower. So to activate this system, we need uh, pumps which are able to pump air inside this structure and the pumps are situated inside the foundation. So they are inside the concrete blocks that you see um, in the bottom picture. All these plants, which are a very complicated uh, system, can be activated in case of emergency in uh, 45 minutes. And in 45 minutes, all the gates will be closed and the lagoon will be sealed. And they can uh, also be deactivated, so the barriers can come down in the rest position and open the lagoon in 15 minutes. So it takes a little bit more time to lift it up, and uh, it is quicker if you want to uh, rest it down. Why? Because um, most of the problems are related to uh, the opening. So uh, the time that was requested for a sudden opening uh, was uh, shorter than uh, the time that was asked to uh, close. Because uh, when the weather conditions are changing, uh, the uh, necessity to open the gates is higher than uh, the necessity to close them at the beginning of the phenomenon. So in these two pictures, you see uh, the real uh, stuff. So uh, in uh, the picture at the bottom, we can see uh, an inlet which is completely closed. So you see these uh, yellow elements which are made of steel. Each one of these elements is 20 meters wide. And there is a gap between the elements. So the elements are not touching themselves there are a few centimeters between them. And so even if, when we say that the uh, barrier is closed, it is not completely watertight. Water is passing through these few uh, centimeters gaps between these uh, yellow tanks. And uh, it's, it is coming in or going out from the lagoon. But the amount of water that can pass through these gaps is very small to the amount of water that will pass through the complete opening. And so from the point of view of the region, this barrier can be uh, considered seeded. Now, let's go to the dimension. Each inlet has a different dimension. Let's start from the uh, Lido inlet. The Lido Inlet, which is uh, the first on the top, has two openings, uh, which are labeled with the, with the numbers three and five. Opening number three is called the Triporti, and it has 21 gates. The depth of this opening, the depth of the water, is six meters, and the width is 420 meters. Then we have opening number five, which is San Nicolò, with 20 gates. The depth is 12 meters is one of the biggest one, and the width is 400 meters. Then if we move south, we go to the second inlet. The second inlet is the Malamocco one. 
The Malamocco one is the deepest one, so uh, it is from this inlet that the biggest ships are coming in. And it has 19 gates. The depth of the sea there is 14 meters, and the width of the inlet is 380 meters. And then on the south of the lagoon, we have the Chioccia Inlet, which has 18 gates and a depth of 11 meters and a width of 360 meters. Now, my work focused on the foundation elements. So the elements that you have seen in the previous slides, we, if we go back here, uh, in the bottom picture, you see the foundation of uh, the dam, which is made of concrete. And in this picture, you see one of these foundation blocks. These foundation blocks are called caissons and they were uh, cast in situ, realized the close to, the, uh, to their final position, and uh, they were built, of course, in phases, and we can see in this table uh, their dimensions. Their dimension is, of course, changing. I will give you only uh, some uh, rough data in order that you have an idea of the dimension of each of these elements. The uh, length L, is measured in the direction of the uh, traffic in the water, so from the sea to the lagoon. The width, W, is measured perpendicular to the opening, so it is measured along the width of the opening, and the uh, depth, H, is, of course, measured in vertical. So we can see that uh, all the uh, cases are 60 meters wide, and has a variable length between 36 and 48 meters, and of course a variable depth between 9 and 12.5 meters. Why? Because the uh, dimension of the iron uh, flaps is of course different uh, according to the uh, depth of the sea, and so also the length of the total element is different. So you may see that each of these monolithic elements is quite big. What can we see also in, in this uh, picture? We can see uh, some empty space inside the, uh, the casin, and uh, the three holes that you uh, see in these uh, pictures are uh, the longitudinal tunnel, which uh, is connecting all the casins together because now that these elements are completely underwater, you can walk inside this tunnel, and this tunnel is open for service reasons, because there are a lot of plants that uh, are located inside these uh, areas, and they uh, are the plants that they activate the gate opening or uh, closing. So this uh, structure is not uh, a monolithic structure. It is hollow inside, and um, you may see that it's, it looks like a waffle, but you will, we, we will see them afterwards together. Let's have a look to the numbers that can describe this, uh, this work. We have 27 submerged caissons, and in this picture you see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 15, 15 of them, the one is under construction, and uh, these are the ones that are completely underwater. Then we have eight abutment cases. Uh, each abutment case is on the side of each opening. So we have four inlets, two abutments for inlet, and a total of eight abutments. The maximum weight of each case is 20,000 tons. The biggest one is weighing 20,000 tons. And the total volume of concrete that has been used is 220,000 cubic meters of concrete for all the cases. Inside this uh, concrete, you can find an average quantity of steel rebars, which is 300 kilograms per cubic meter. But the 18% of these steel rebars is made of stainless steel because uh, stainless steel was used to avoid rebar corrosion in the most dangerous uh, areas. 
So all the walls that are directly in contact with seawater or directly in contact with air, remember that air there is a very salty one, so you find a lot of ions inside the air. Uh, so all these walls are realized with stainless steel. Then you can see that on each caisson there are uh, some uh, square blocks which are uh, the location for the inches and we have 156 inches uh, that are connecting each caisson with the flap gates made of steel. So in total we have 78 flap gates made of steel and uh, 78 multiplied by 2 plus 8 spare hinges. The total weight of the steel work of the flap gates is 23,000 tons. In this picture, you see uh, a detail of uh, the flap gate and of the hinges. You see this uh, in the picture in gray. There is the, the flap gate, the one that you have seen a picture uh, painted in yellow in the previous slides. And uh, you can also see the hinge, which is the connection between this uh, flap gate and the uh, concrete case. This hinge that you see here in the picture is divided into two elements, a yellow element, which is the uh, male element, which uh, weighs 12 tons, and a gray element, which is the female element, which is heavier and it weighs uh, 30 tons. The female, so the gray element, is uh, fixed inside the, the concrete caisson and it is tensed to the concrete cation by means of uh, 10 post tensioning bars. Whereas the yellow part is uh, connected to the uh, flap uh, gate by means of a um, hinge which uh, can uh, resist a force of 3000 uh, kilonewtons. In this slide, you can see the uh, finite element model of the steel uh, flap gate and the uh, transportation system of this steel gate from the shore to the uh, actual position. Uh, these gates are uh, removable because of maintenance, so there is a continuous maintenance which is always uh, repainting and cleaning one of these elements and then replacing it on the site. And so all these elements can be detached, taken away, uh, taken to the shore, uh, cleaned, repainted and uh, taken again in their position. And you can see on the uh, right also the uh, dimension of these elements and their weight is between 170 tons and 330 tons of steel. So now that we have seen the numbers, let's have a look to the money. If we do some rough calculation, we can uh, calculate that the uh, concrete that was used to realize, realize the casing uh, costed 26 million euros. We had 60 million of ordinary steel rebars, 60 million of stainless steel rebars, because stainless steels cost more or less five times ordinary steels, 234 million euros for the inches. Each of these inches costs one and a half million euro. 52 million euros is the cost of the special ship used to install and maintain the gates and 70 million euros is the cost of the steel and the realization of the flat gates. So if we sum together all this stuff, we reach 0.5 billion euros, which is the cost of the structures without plans and without all the geotechnical works that has been done on the foundation. To realize this 
uh, structure uh, were used 1,000 workers per year in the construction sites for many years and uh, 3,000 workers in satellite activities. The total cost of the operation was 5.5 billion euros. So the cost of the structure of the dam itself is only the 10% of the total cost. And we will see together what is the real big amount of money. Uh, most of the people uh, do not know that the biggest expense was not related to the realization of the dam itself, but is related to all the other interventions that have been done on the lagoon. More than 1,600 hectares of naturalistic habitat, which is called Barene in Italian, uh, has been restored. And you can see uh, a Barena in the picture at the bottom of the right of this slide. 200 kilometers of channels have been consolidated five ex-chemical industrial polluted sites have been decontaminated in the Porto Marghera zone. 45 kilometers of shore interested by pollution of the ground were waterproofed in order to avoid these pollution agents to go inside the sea. And 60 kilometers of beaches have been uh, strengthened and protected from the tides and the waves using 9.2 million cubic meters of sand and uh, creating eight kilometers of new dunes. One million of new bushes, you can see in the picture in the center, were uh, implanted on these dunes. So most of the cost of the operation is in this slide and is not related to the actual dam. And now let's go to the main topic of this presentation, which is what I did in this work. So what was done with uh, Diana in, uh, for the construction of this dam? Uh, we have done the um, autogenous deformation uh, analysis. So we modeled the uh, construction procedure, all the construction phase to control and avoid cracking during construction to ensure the maximum durability to the structure. The service life of this structure is 100 years and maintenance is almost impossible to be done to the concrete elements because they are underground, underwater. So in a severe environment and without the possibility of doing uh, any traditional maintenance intervention. So durability was the biggest concern when realizing this concrete structure. What were the instruments that we used? A proper mix design for concrete has been uh, searched and uh, special mix designs have been designed for this uh, work. So uh, not ordinary concretes were used they were absolutely tailor-made in order to uh, gain all the quality and the characteristics that we will see in the, follows, in the following slides. Then the construction phases were uh, followed with a structural non-linear analysis done uh, with uh, Diana. The zones with the higher probability of cracking were evaluated with this non-linear analysis and the reinforcement that was calculated for uh, all the other loads and actions that uh, were placed on the structure were changed where necessary to satisfy crack control during construction. I have to remind you that uh, the caissons were not built in the place, in their final place. So they uh, have been placed in their final position by uh, dragging them in the seawater. So the caissons uh, should be able to um, float. And they have been moving uh, like floating rafts for kilometers from the construction point to the uh, sinking point. 
So the physical phenomena that were taken into account in the uh, finite element analysis of uh, these uh, cases are uh, the phase construction, the hydration heat during hardening of concrete, the heat diffusion inside concrete, the heat dispersion to the surrounding environment in the air during construction, differential shrinkage and creep because we had many construction phases, so many different concrete with different ages, so different shrinkage laws, different creep laws, and also different shrinkage and creep inside the same element. Because if you cast one wall, which is one meter thick, you will have a shrinkage uh, on the external surfaces and a much lower shrinkage in the core of the wall. So differential not only from structure to structure, but only in but also inside the same element. That is non-planar imposed deformation that are coming from thermal shrinkage and creep. So again, if we are casting one wall which is one meter thick, we will have that the temperature inside the wall will be higher than the, than the temperature on the surfaces. And so we will have non-uniform uh, imposed thermal deformation due to hydration heat. Then, of course, self-weight. Then we, we took into consideration the nonlinear concrete behavior uh, that was modeled as a linear material in compression because the stresses that uh, were reached during the construction phases were very small compared to the ultimate compressive strength of concrete but we had a smeared crack model intention to uh, calculate the variation of stiffness due to uh, cracking and then the variation of the mechanical properties of concrete during hardening it means uh, compressive resistance of material is variable tensile resistance of concrete is considered to be variable and modulus of elasticity of concrete is also considered to be variable according to the degrees of reaction. The concrete requirements that uh, were asked by the owner of the structure was a reduced heat generation during hydration in order to have low temperatures and small thermal gradients in the walls a maximum water cement ratio of 0.45, a maximum cement content plus mineral additives that of 550 kilograms per cubic meter, reduced values of hygrometric shrinkage in the first 30 days, high fluidity to ensure high compactness of the casting and lower permeability, then a seven days curing period during which uh, temperature and humidity was controlled, uh, was asked to facilitate the hydration and the proper maturation of concrete. The concrete cover of steel rebars was quite high, between five, uh, between four and five centimeters. And uh, stainless steel was used for slab and walls, which was falling into the uh, aggressivity class XS3. Uh, stainless steel was used uh, in the first one in the first 10 centimeters from the surface and then uh, concrete should be uh, a low permeability uh, to chloride one and according to the american standard the ASTM, uh, the class was to be low so uh, an example of the mixed design that was used uh, there was not only one mixed design, we had uh, uh, at least four different mixed design because each construction company has its own choices. This is one, just to uh, understand it. We had uh, 380 uh, kilograms per cubic meter of cement two, then uh, a special uh, very fine filler, 120 uh, kilograms per cubic meter. Then we have gravel, sand, sand water, uh, super plasticizer, an acrylic one, a uh, shrinkage retardant agent, and an anti segregation agent to increase workability, fluidity, and compaction of the material. So, now let's have a look to the geometry of the uh, casings. 
You see in uh, these pictures, the, the green ones at the bottom are uh, two pictures taken from Diana, from the mesh of the uh, caisson itself. Uh, it is a cellular structure. It is characterized uh, by four to five horizontal slabs. You can see them in the cross section on the top. So we have the bottom slab in yellow, then a channel one, a dark blue one, and uh, the brown ones on the top. And a grid of vertical partitions, you can see them on the left, uh, which had a spacing of about 50, of about five meters in both directions. So uh, it is a multicellular, highly hyperstatic structure. And the average thickness of these walls is about 40 centimeters. But uh, the thickest one were around one meter and 10 centimeters, and the thinner one were uh, 30 centimeters thick. So the finite element model that was realized with, uh, with Diana was uh, done. Uh, I will show you one of the one that I have did. That I did. Uh, this one was done in 2009 using uh, Diana 9.2. We had uh, 5,000 nodes for a total of uh, 300,000 degrees of freedom because we have three, uh, six degrees of freedom on, on each node, three displacement and three uh, rotation. Uh, for a single case, uh, 18,300 layered shell elements were used. Uh, each element had five layers. Uh, 13 different shell geometries were used according to different thicknesses of the walls and of the slabs. 65 uh, concrete materials were used because, uh, as I told you, a different hydration in different layers of each uh, layer of shell were taken into account. So we had that each layer, each shell had five materials, five different materials inside. Reinforcement was placed using 1,800 reinforcement grids that were following 56 different grid geometries according to different reinforcement ratio in uh, different directions. The construction time of one case was about uh, 200 days and uh, the analysis uh, was uh, covering uh, 200 days plus uh, other 200 days after uh, construction. So a total uh, length of the uh, construction time of 400 days. During this period, 17 construction phases were individuated. Each construction phase corresponds to the construction of a new part of the caisson and um, an average of about eight steps, eight time steps uh, was uh, placed inside each construction phases. So at the end, the uh, complete history was 135 time uh, steps. If you imagine that uh, it is a non-linear analysis, each time step has each time step has convergence iteration. So typically, convergence can be reached after two or three uh, iterations, but also seven, eight, ten iteration in each time step. So at the end, uh, the, na the number of analyses uh, related to this. Uh, calculation was around 1,000 runs. Of course, uh, in 2009, uh, the available uh, computers were not the one that we are using now. Uh, this calculation was done on a Sun Ultra 40 workstation with two MAD Opteron uh, CPUs, dual core. Uh, 2 gigahertz of uh, clock frequencies, 1 megabyte of cache, 32 gigabyte of uh, RAM memory, and SATA hard drives. The result of the analysis of one case is around uh, 100 gigabyte of results, and the calculation time was 360 hours. Yes, the machine was running for 360 hours to get the result. Of course, not in a single shot. You remember 17 phases. At the end of each construction phases, a backup 
was automatically done on the hard drive and a new analysis was started. And that was one of the best features of, of Diana that uh, allowed us not to lose so many uh, data if something was not going uh, right in each phase. 360 hours is about 15 days of continuous machine crunch. In this table, you can see a description of the uh, construction phases. You see 17 construction phases corresponding to the casting of different elements. And uh, in bold, uh, you can see the uh, days, uh, days from first casting, FFC. Uh, so 180 days to complete the uh, construction and then 220 days to follow the maturation and hardening of concrete uh, after uh, construction. In this picture, we see uh, some extracts from the actual uh, Diana files. Uh, this uh, uh, file is the, the COM file, the file that uh, was uh, running uh, the analysis. Uh, with uh, version 10 of uh, Diana is not called the COM file anymore, but uh, it looks like this one. And uh, here you can see that the first phase from zero to 10 days was the casting of the first slab. You see the mesh of this slab. And uh, we had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight time steps. The first time steps are small in order to follow the variation of mechanical properties at the beginning, and uh, then they become bigger. Then we can see the second uh, phase, uh, and you can see that uh, a part of the walls in the uh, left corner is coming up, and then the third phase with another part of the walls which is uh, coming up. You may imagine 17 of these different phases all with a different analysis like this one. The key parameter of this kind of analysis is the degree of hydration. The degree of hydration inside uh, Diana environment is uh, called R, and it is the ratio between the hydration heat, heat Q, uh, produced at the time T and a degree of reaction R, uh, with respect to the uh, total uh, uh, hydration heat at the end of the process, measured per uh, cubic meter, so per unit of volume. So we can write that the uh, hydration heat, Q, TR, is the integral between zero, zero the uh, beginning of the hydration reaction, and time T of the uh, gradient of the heat production, uh, lowercase q, function of the time tau and the degree of reaction r. This uh, gradient of heat production it can be divided into two uh, contributions. The first, the first contribution, uh, qr function of r, is a function of the degree of reaction. The degree of reaction is a number that starts from zero, beginning of reaction, and goes to one, 100% 1, at the end of the reaction. And a second contribution, which is QT, function of temperature, T, which is governed by the Arrhenius constant, because uh, you may know that uh, the chemical hydration uh, reaction of concrete uh, is faster if uh, it happens at a higher temperature. So the hydration reaction is a reaction which is exothermic, it produces heat, this heat increases the temperature of concrete, and this increase in the temperature uh, speeds up the reaction. So, uh, in uh, Diana, this uh, degree of reaction um, model uh, can be uh, used with uh, um, solid elements and, uh, um, let's say, plain stress, plain strain elements but let's imagine solid elements. It cannot be applied to shell elements. So uh, two models were done. Uh, the first model is a 3D uh, model done with uh, brick elements uh, for coupled thermal mechanical analysis to calculate the evolution of the degree of reaction in each kind of wall. 
and the variation of the mechanical properties of concrete related to the degree of reaction. The results of this uh, model have been transferred to the multi-layer shell element, uh, which uh, does not perform a couplet thermal mechanical analysis, but performs only a mechanical analysis using the input of the previous model. Heat diffusion is uh, calculated both inside the concrete and uh, in the uh, environment. So uh, the uh, heat diffusion follows the Fourier differential equation for heat. And we have heat flow and heat accumulation per uh, unit of, of volume. The thermal capacity of concrete was taken from bibliography. There are a lot of studies that are related to concrete thermal capacity. And we can see that thermal capacity of concrete uh, can vary according to the reaction uh, of about uh, 15%. And uh, it is uh, around, uh, let's say, 1,000 joule per kilogram per Kelvin degree. Also, the thermal conductivity is a parameter that is not constant because uh, at the beginning when concrete is more fluid the thermal conductivity is higher and also the thermal capacity is higher then when concrete is hardening uh, both thermal conductivity and thermal capacity are uh, decreased and you see here other bibliography uh, values for uh, this parameter the average value is uh, between uh, uh, 1.5 and 3 joule per kilogram per uh, Kelvin. Heat dispersion in the uh, atmosphere is uh, a function of uh, uh, the wind speed, and uh, it is uh, described both by uh, European codes, the blue curve, and by Japanese codes, the pink cur curve here. And uh, an equivalent conductivity is given as a function of the wind speed. For this study, uh, a slow wind speed was uh, taken into account uh, because uh, the construction site was quite protected, being it under the ground level. So, the uh, concrete that uh, was used was tested in adiabatic condition, so uh, hydration in a completely uh, sealed environment without uh, transmission of heat from uh, the concrete specimen to the outside. And uh, the red curve that you see here was plotted. This is the increase of temperature in fully adiabatic condition as a function of time on the horizontal axis. The same uh, hydration reaction has been uh, done inside uh, Diana uh, to fit the uh, production of heat, the heat production gradients, these equations that you see in these slides, especially the lowercase q. The lowercase q as a function of r and time was calculated in order to have a perfect superposition of the numerical curve in blue and the uh, experimental one that you see here. So a first little model of a concrete cube specimen was done in fully adiabatic condition. Then semi-adiabatic conditions were uh, analyzed. Semi-adiabatic means that a, a concrete cube uh, well, it is not a cube, it's a prism, uh, which was uh, 40 by 40 by 80 centimeters, the dimensions, uh, was uh, measured during harden, hardening, and we may see that uh, the red curve is the uh, temperature increase in the midpoint of the specimen as a function of time on the horizontal axis, and the blue curve is the uh, temperature increase on the only phase of the prism which was exposed to the air, so where we had heat dispersion. And you may see that there is 10 degrees of maximum gradient between these two uh, points. In uh, red dashed and uh, blue dashed, we have the two numerical curves for uh, obtained with, uh, with Diana, 
two uh, that are following the temperature increase in the same two points. So the second model that we did was a semi-adiabatic model, and this model was used to calibrate the uh, thermal capacity of concrete and the uh, thermal conductivity of concrete that were unknown. In the green curve is, of course, the air temperature during the test. So what we got at the end of this uh, calibration procedure, we got different uh, QR function of the degrees of reaction curves. And you may see these are six different kinds of concretes that were all tested in the same condition and they gave us different results. So you may see that the uh, dark blue concrete is a very explosive one. Uh, it is very quick. It generates a lot of heat at the beginning of the reaction. So it is a rapid concrete, whereas the green uh, curve is a very soft one. And it means that it is a concrete that is not generating a lot of heat and it is generating it slowly. So from our point of view, this green and red curve were much better than the yellow and the blue ones. Then the calibration procedure went on measuring the variation of compressive strength at different days. You may see from the graphs here in blue are the laboratory tests. So the compressive strength of concrete was tested at one day, two days, three days, seven days. Uh, 10 days, 28 days, and a uh, uh, isothermal uh, numerical model for hydration of concrete was done in the Indiana to calculate the degree of reaction that was corresponding to the same uh, days and to uh, find the red curve, which is the variation of the strength, not as a function of time, but as a function of the degree of reaction. So once that we know this red curve, we can apply this red curve to every casting because it is not function of uh, isothermal behavior or adiabatic behavior or semi-adiabatic behavior. It is only function of that kind of material because the degree of reaction is an independent variable. The same procedure has been done for uh, tensile strength. Of course, the measure of tensile strength, it is more difficult. And so we were missing some points that uh, were corresponding to very low degrees of reactions and was done for the uh, modulus of uh, elasticity. Then uh, shrinkage uh, measures were uh, done in laboratory on the uh, concrete that uh, was used. So uh, you can see from this picture, the yellow points are, uh, let's say the gold points, are the uh, values of shrinkage measured on the real specimen in laboratory. In uh, the dashed curve is the uh, shrinkage curve provided by model code 9, so uh, in literature for the same kind of uh, material. So you may see there are some differences between literature and real life. And uh, the continuous blue curve is the uh, curve that was used as an input inside uh, the finite element uh, model uh, placed in Indiana for the uh, specimen tested in laboratory. But the uh, real structure has not the dimension of the specimens, of the small specimen that we tested in laboratory. And so the real structure being big has a bigger hydraulic radius. And we can see just for comparison, the uh, green and the red curves, which are the shrinkage of a slab uh, with a thickness of 20 centimeters and of a slab with a thickness of 45 centimeters compared with to the laboratory specimen. Of course, done with the same concrete. And the last but not least parameter that was taken into consideration was creep because creep plays a determinant role. It's the most important, the key parameter in this kind of analysis because creep at, uh, for young hardening concrete is very, very high. 
and uh, it has a very strong effect changing the stress level and um, controlling in a deep way the uh, cracking phenomena. CRIP has been modeled by using Kelvin chain according to the model provided by uh, Diana uh, code. And you may see the equation of this chain uh, written here and the physical model. A Kelvin chain is a chain that is done with uh, uh, elastic springs, uh, the one uh, labeled with the E, uh, the high letter, and dumpers, the uh, one um, leveled with the uh, eta uh, parameter. These parameters should be evaluated on uh, specimens that has been tested in, uh, in laboratory. And so uh, for each kind of concrete, uh, creep test uh, was done in, uh, in laboratory and the uh, creep curves for different loading ages has been drawn. In this picture, you see the comparison between the real uh, laboratory curves, which are the red and the uh, green uh, with the marker, the red, the green, the blue and the uh, brown with the marker, whereas uh, we have the uh, numerical uh, curves in dash dot uh, line and the uh, literature curve in uh, dashed line. So let's focus on the red one just to understand the phenomena and the same thing can be applied to the other one. The red one is loading applied at two days, two days of age of concrete. So the uh, continuous red with markers is the um, strain measured taking into account both creep and shrinkage. The continuous line without marker is what we get if we take away shrinkage and so it is only the creep strain. The dashed, uh, dot dashed curve is the input that we placed inside the Diana code and the dashed uh, line is uh, the model code provision. So for a load at very young age, we see that the creep is stronger than uh, what the code was uh, telling us. And so the real measure was very important. The concrete non-linearity in uh, tension was uh, modeled with this uh, scheme, which is a linear tension softening uh, scheme, very simple. And uh, um, the failure envelope is a linear variable failure envelope that is very well known in, in literature. So I, I think there is nothing uh, peculiar to say about this model, it is a very uh, diffuse and well-known smeared crack approach. So what we see here, here we see uh, the models of a square meter, a single square meter of one element, let's say one uh, wall or one slab. We have plenty of them, many tenths of them, and a couple of the, uh, hydration heat uh, analysis has been done on, on these uh, simple uh, elements. Imagining that the uh, heat transfer was uh, possible only on the external surfaces and not from one element to the other because more or less all the elements were in the same uh, conditions in, uh, in their plane. And what we get as a result here uh, is the uh, on the picture on the left is the evolution of the temperature as a function of time in the layers of this wall and the evolution of the degree of reaction on the picture on the right as a function of time in each layer of the wall. So temperature was used as an input to generate a thermal load on the shell each of these curves corresponds to one of the layers of the multi-layer shell used in Indiana. And uh, hydration uh, degree, R, was used to calculate the evolution of the mechanical properties, uh, compression resistance, tensile resistance, and modulus of elasticity in the same five layers. So when these outputs were available, 
a phased analysis was done with the multilayer curved shell elements and the results in terms of uh, cracking uh, areas uh, were uh, achieved. You see uh, in the picture on the top, we can see the uh, strain uh, predicted, the average strain predicted on the crack, what is called the AKNN1 in Diana, and uh, on a wall of our structure. And in the uh, picture on the bottom, you see uh, with the disk uh, output the uh, direction, so the orientation of this crack. So we can see that uh, for this wall, almost all the wall was uncracked, white, whereas we had uh, cracking at the interface between the wall and the slab, of course, because the slab at the base was providing some kind of restraint to the shrinkage and to the swelling of the wall, and also some vertical cracks uh, in correspondence of uh, the junction between uh, the uh, one construction phase and the other construction phase. In this picture, we see again another kind of, of wall. Uh, here we have a, a more diffused cracking, and uh, uh, most of the wall is uncracked, uh, whereas we can see some concentration of stresses and, uh, and cracking in uh, some special points, and also the directions of the crack in the picture at the bottom. We can uh, end with uh, a picture of the slab. Uh, this is the uh, first slab, the foundation one, and uh, um, you may see that uh, uh, the stresses inside the slab are uh, plotted in the uh, bottom uh, uh, image and we can see that the stresses in uh, Pascal are uh, between uh, 1 and 3 megapascal, that is uh, close to the cracking uh, strength of the material and in the picture on the top we can see that we have some cracking concentrated in an, in an area you see all the discs are uh, concentrated in around around an area and this cracking can also be seen in the bottom picture is in the orange areas of of this lab so at the end of construction i had the pleasure to visit the real specimen and uh, to go on the construction site and to see if any cracks were present on the uh, real specimen. Of course, cracks were present. They were good enough, so um, I think they were quite satisfied by the results achieved. You see here two pictures, my hand in the left picture, and uh, you may see that, uh, for instance, the crack on the right picture uh, is exactly uh, in the position that you see here on, on this wall. So the, this uh, little hole was done close to the uh, area where we see the disc in this wall. So we found a good overall uh, accordance between the uh, numerical results and the uh, real uh, results. Of course, we cannot say that each single crack was mapped that's impossible. But uh, we will succeed in identifying the regions where this crack were going to happen, the direction of this crack, and reinforcement was strengthened in that areas to control their width. So now all the caissons are in position, the dam is uh, finished, uh, it is operative, it is working, and no problems related to uh, crack opening uh, was uh, found both during construction and during operative life. So we don't have a water leakage inside these uh, elements underwater and uh, all the uh, navigation was done in perfect safety. So the uh, analysis that was uh, done uh, using Diana not only for the, the case that you see uh, today, it was a collaboration that lasted for years between the uh, MOSE Authority and uh, our university, it was a milestone in Italy in uh, defining the uh, autogenous uh, deformation 
related to uh, concrete hardening at a very young age, shrinkage and uh, thermal deformation. Thank you very much for your attention and I will be glad to answer to your questions.